Sean hit it right on the head. It is good to see you guys. Molars, not much has happened since last time I saw you, I'm sure. If you don't know, go talk to him. Pretty exciting stuff. Ways, it's good to see you. Alicia, man, that last month of pregnancy, so exciting. I remember, man, when March hit, me and my wife were like, oh, man, it's any day now. Like, come on, where's this baby already? Every day that passes, a little bit more excited, so super exciting stuff. That last song, I just love it so much. And then I've had some really long conversation with my Calvinistic friends about it, and those are fun times. I have decided to follow Jesus. Yeah, right, Jesus picked you. Well, kind of goes both ways. The morning's message is on joy. Um, joy is something that as my dad kind of mentioned that he'd like me to preach this Sunday, I was thinking, man, what am I going to preach on, right? And, man, you can go anywhere. Do I want to do the next part in Revelation or whatnot? But joy is something that has continually been on my heart these last few months because it's something that's really hard for me to have. I'm a very introverted person. I am very much want to figure things out on my own. I'm very much uh, kind of a pessimistic outlook on life at times. Um, you read the news, you watch things going on, it's hard to have lots of joy in what's going on in the world around us. It's a scary place, it's a dark place. Um, wickedness is rampant, wickedness is celebrated. And so the Lord really has impressed upon me the need for joy. And so as I was thinking about this, the that's the funny thing about preaching is you have to start kind of living out a couple weeks in advance, right? Um, so I'm like, okay, Lord, how can I preach about joy but not have joy myself? And so for those of you that know, I do HVAC, and the turn of the seasons is my least favorite time. You know, i got to put on a couple more layers, hop in some crawl spaces that usually this time of year have lots of water in them. And so joy is not something that comes naturally for me in that. But for those of you that know my brother, joy is something that is very natural for him. I don't know how he does it. And so I'm just glad the Lord puts people in our lives that can remind us of joy. So what is joy? I've um, got three questions this morning. What is the joy of the Lord? How do we get the joy of the Lord? And then how do we use the joy of the Lord? And so I started praying, thinking about, okay, Lord, what do you want me to say? And it became very clear. He doesn't want me to say anything. He wants the scriptures to say something. So turn with me to Romans 4.17. As I start laying a little bit of the groundwork, for those of you that need a Bible, we'll be needing, we'll be bouncing around quite a bit, so throw your hand up. Joe can grab you a Bible if you need one. Um, we'll be having some fun this morning. If I can get there. Romans 14.17. So, joy is something that's supernatural. Um, that's point number one. Um, we have lots of feelings, we have lots of emotions, but joy is something that we cannot muster up on our own. So as Romans talks about here in chapter 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now this thing is, this thing is an eternal thing. It's a thing that resides where God resides. Um... There's a very big difference from the joy that the Lord brings and the joy that the world brings. Um, the world may promise lots of things. The world may come to a lot of different things. But true joy comes from God alone. A uh, quote here by Thomas Watson. There's a difference between spiritual joys and earthly, as between a banquet that is eaten and one that is painted on the wall. As my dad has talked about in the past, there's a difference between shadows and substance, right? That it might be nice to look at a good meal on the wall, but it's another thing to actually be eating it. You go to the restaurants and they have the pictures, right? Or you watch the commercials on, uh, on TV and the meal always looks way better on the picture and then you get in and it's not the same. But it is very nice to be eating something instead of just looking at it. Um, in Luke, we hop over to Luke 15. The greatest example of joy is the Jesus himself. So in Luke 15, he tells us three stories. Three stories of let's see. Three stories of joy. Should I put bookmarks in here? 
So the parable of the lost sheep, right? In Luke 15, verse 4, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. But when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which, I, which was lost. I say to you likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who needs no repentance. Joy is something that, as we talked about, is continual in the eternals, right? The kingdom of heaven is joy. Um, what are they rejoicing? So here's the first example. Rejoicing over lost, um, lost sinners. Um, we were all there at one point. Um, we were all lost. And the fact that the angels are rejoicing over us tells us something about who angels are. That angels are not only praising and worshiping God, as we read through last week in Revelation, but they are watching our lives on earth. They are seeing us and seeing us come into a relationship with Jesus and rejoicing for us in that. Um, the next one, we have the parable of the lost coin. Um, or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I, which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then the most famous story, the parable of the lost son. Um, and man... I definitely relate to this guy in a lot of ways. Um, you have a great dad, you have a great life, and then you say, I want to make a life of my own. So give me what belongs to me, which is set apart for me. He goes and wastes it all. And what's he do? He realizes where he's at. Um, where is it at? But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. So verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry, for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They began to be merry. God takes joy in us coming back to him. That I've been doing a lot of studies here in the Old Testament, and it's, it's such a refreshing thing to read through the Old Testament and not just hear what people say about the Old Testament, because what you hear a lot is God is an angry God, that God is an unjust God at times, but when you look through the Old Testament and you see how God loves the nation of Israel, you see this kind of dad right here, a dad that runs to find his son, you see a dad that gives the best things to his son, that this is a joyous God. So this is what joy is. It's a supernatural origin. It is something that comes from God and God alone. Um, so how do we get this joy of the Lord? So let's go to John 10, 28. So John 10, 28. That this joy is lasting. That this joy is something that is not p uh, passing. You know, we have happiness. We have times where um, I'm absolutely thrilled. One of my favorite things to do is come home from work and see my son and just watch how happy he gets. It's something that I can't describe. I'm not even going to try and describe. Um, but then it's so quickly where then life starts happening, right? And you start seeing the dishes and you start seeing the chores you got to do. And then you got to go outside and take out the trash and things like that where, oh, I was happy, but now I'm, you know, going through the slums or whatnot, where how can I make that joy last through all those things? As you guys have known, me and my dad have gotten into pickleball lately. He talks about way too much, I'm sure. Um, 
it still amazes me that my dad still finds joy in it because I'm pretty good at pickleball, and I put him in his place. So you want to talk to my dad about joy? He lives it very good because we have too much fun out there. But I've been thinking, how do I have that joy that I play playing, playing pickleball, seeing my son, all these things? What is this joy that I have? I like pickleball not because it's a fun sport. I don't like pickleball because we run with the fellowship you have with people is just incredible. Um, it's just, there's things that you guys do in life that bring you joy. I don't need to tell you exactly what joy is. You know what joy is, whether it's, you know, family, whether it's friends, whether it's activities, whatever it may be. You know what joy is. But how quickly we move on from that joy and move on to something else. So what is this joy that we can have? So abiding in Christ, John 10:28. And I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So abiding with Christ is not something that we can lose. It is not something that can be taken away from us. So 1 John 2, 3-6. through 6. This idea of abiding, it's a, you know, a popular terminology in Christian circles or whatnot. But it simply means just knowing Christ, to wa- walking with Christ. I think First John sums it up in a way that makes it very real to me, makes it very convicting to me. So First John 2, verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Speaking of Christ. So this idea of abiding is, it's a, it's a lifestyle change. It's not just, you know, we have, you know, the day that we give our lives to Christ and everything. What a glorious day that is. But it's a continual habit. It's this changing our mindset from an old man to a new man. He who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. It's very, it's very convicting to me. Um, keeping God's commandments is hard, right? Um, the Old Testament had several commandments, and people failed them all the time, and they needed sacrifices year after year. But Jesus came. And Jesus came, and he died for those sins. He died for the areas that we don't follow him. So what's this saying here? If we keep his commandments, uh, if we say we keep his commandments, um, but do not keep them as a liar, and the truth is not in him. What's the idea of this? Because we know Jesus picks up where we, le- where, um, we left off or whatnot. But what is this saying? Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. It's that mindset change. It's the every day starting over new. His mercies are new every morning, as the psalmist says. So, jump over with me to... Where is it? Oh no, I lost it. Okay. Trial by fire here. Let's go to John. Trust the Holy Spirit will lead us there. Mm. Oh, praise the Lord. John 15, 1. This idea of abiding. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. And the branch cannot bear fruit in of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. You know, we know what trees are, right? We know what branches are. This is not a new analogy for us. But the analogy is very profound. Um, The sense of abiding is the same idea of a branch being knitted in with a tree. Um, I think it is something to note that every branch that bears fruit he prunes um, that it's not just an easy life abiding with Christ 
it's not an easy life to just be able to go through the motions of life. That God will prune us. Pruning is the sense of cutting, cutting away of worthless things so that the tree may grow even stronger. For those of you who are in farm and agriculture and everything, trees get too big, you prune them, they grow back stronger and everything. Um, God will make wounds for the gospel. Um, but a br- And as the branch cannot bear fruit in and of itself, that any of you that thinks they are something is a nothing, right? Philippians talks about, Paul talks about his, um, who he is in the flesh, right? Of the tribe of Benjamin, you know, as a priest or as a Pharisee, all these things that, you know, people, it's very easy for us to think we are someone. You do ministry long enough, you start thinking, oh, maybe I'm really good at ministry. But here it is, that the branch cannot bear fruit in of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. They are gathered and thrown into the fire. I think it's really easy for our sinful natures to, when we reject God, to go think that we're going to go do something great. That, you know, all the greatest, you know, greatest, the most infamous wicked men in history have, you know, gone on these huge crusades to crucify Christians, to reject Christ. But the idea here is a branch that is withered and cast on the ground. They're not doing nothing besides rotting on the ground. And the day will come when they are gathered up and thrown into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified and you will bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You know, people like this verse, right? Um... You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. But it comes on contingencies. Um, We have to be abiding with Christ. I've noticed in my life, there's a lot of things I've wanted. There's a lot of things that I've set plans for, and they've come to nothing. It's like, but Lord, I prayed about them. You know, I did all the things. I fasted, talked to all the stuff. But was I abiding in Christ? And as you start to abide in Christ, those plans start to change. You know, the things that you pray for are a little bit more special than, man, I'd really like that new phone that's out or that new car or you know, Lord, man, this career is really great. I think I should really go for it. Oh, maybe I should talk. Is this a career that you want me to go in? You'll start cha- noticing your prayer life is different. Talk to someone who's been with the been with the Lord a while and just tell them to pray for you and see the things that they pray for. So abiding with Christ. John 15, uh, 1 through 11, we read that. But then John 16, 20, verse 24. Until now... What is it? Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask that you will receive, that your joy will be full. Full. And God seeks to have your joy full. It's not something that um, comes naturally. He wants you to seek for it. Um, ask and uh, you will receive. So our Christian duty, Philippians 3, 1. Bouncing over, Philippians. chapter 3, verse 1. So we've talked about where joy comes from. we talk about how do we get this joy. But what do we do with this joy? Is it something we keep for ourselves? Is it something we put on the back burner to use at times? Philippians comes here and says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 I just love, 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 love that the scriptures say some of the same things over and over again. It's not just this book that you have to hope is true or whatnot, but it is a continuality through all of it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 I can find it. First Thessalonians 5, chapter 16. I made you turn all this way here for two words. Rejoice always. Some of the most simple things in the Bible, some of the most simple truths in scriptures is some of the most profound things. We can write this whole paragraph on why we should always rejoice. We should re- write books, and many people do of why joy is so important. But here comes the scriptures and just say rejoice always. 
doesn't leave room for interpretation, doesn't leave um, room for us to interject our own thought. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If we can live by just those three things, I wonder how different our lives would change. Rejoice always. What do we do in times of trial? Rejoice. What do we do when we can't sleep? Pray without ceasing. What do we do when we're busy at work? Oh, still pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Even for the bad things. Even for the hard things. For those of you that have done life for any amount of time, hard things come. Hard things are not something that I really love. I'm from a small town, from a small family, that it's easy to, you know, kind of isolate yourself from the world. But as you get into the world, as you start seeing around you, hard things come around, and giving God thanks for everything is really hard. But here it is, the will of God. So it is our duty, it is our responsibility, it is expected of us. Um, Billy Sunday, um, you know, he was a baseball player, but then he became one of the greatest evangelicals of the first two decades in the 20th century. If you have no joy in your religion, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. Uh, it is a mark of a Christian. It is the lifestyle of a Christian. It is the essence of a Christian, joy. When people see you, do they see something different? When they see you in a room, does things light up? Or they walk, see you come in and be like, oh, better watch what I say so you know they don't freak out. or what? No, joy should be something that's overflowing in the Christian life. This is further proved in Acts 5, 41. The, um, this is, you know, the early church. Christ is back in heaven. They are now prophesying, doing these things, teaching. Um, religious leaders do not like it. This whole story is extremely cool. They bring him into court. Um, and then I think it's really cool what this Pharisee says. That if, it is of man, if their uh, mission, if their goal is of man, it's going to come to nothing. But if it's go if of God, um, we can't stop it. Very wise words. <laughs> um, so in verse 41, though, they were a little bit more back up. They, so they depart in, where is it? In verse 40, and they agreed with him. And when they, were and when they had been called for apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus l and let them go. So they command them not to speak Jesus, and they beat them, and then said, okay, go about your way. So what, the, what were the apostles' response to this? So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That is not something that is a knee-jerk reaction to persecution. It is not something that comes naturally for Christians, for when we are persecuted to, man, Lord, thank you for that. Let's go do it again. Um, so the, the disciples showing us that there is a joy in suffering. Many more stories in scripture about this. The lack of time will move on. So 1 Peter 1, chapter, um, verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We're going to live here for a minute. First, um... are very gracious to stick around for this. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3 talking about our place in the eternals. This is something that is very um, very dang, there's a really good word I'm looking for but it's very very easy to have joy when we're thinking about our place in the eternals. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away from you, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be re revealed in the last time, in this you greatly rejoice, 
Though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Let the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom you have not seen you love. Though you, uh, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So who initiated? God initiated it. It is a faith. It is something that um, I have lots and lots of discussions with people who are intellectually trying to do Christianity. Um, and intellectually, it is hard. It, intellectually, it might be impossible. It is a faith whom you have not seen you love. How many in here can say they love Jesus? But we've never seen Jesus, right? But we know, we believe with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, and then we receive um, the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So this inheritance, it's incorruptible. You know, you read through human history, there's been rich people, right, who by worldly standards have massive wealth, who have massive uh, legacies, all these things, but they're all corruptible, they're all defiled, and they do fade away. I mean, tell me who the richest person was 500 years ago. Probably can't tell me. You know, you go back just 50 years ago, m maybe you might be able to tell me. These things, they're so pursued by the world, but they, they don't last at all. So, but this is our inheritance as Christians, as believers. It is incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away. And where is it reserved in heaven for you? Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I love that God doesn't gloss over the fact that trials are a real thing. Um, you know, Jesus talked about, they hated me. Guess what? They'll probably hate you. Um, so trials are a real thing. Expect them, believers. But what, what's the purpose of them? That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Psalm 2, chapter, uh, verse 1. Again, this idea of we know what the future is. It's such a valuable asset, right? For those of you that do sports, could you imagine knowing the outcome of every game? Could you imagine what it'd be like to know exactly how your day is going to go? Um, it is something that I just can't believe the Lord has shown us. You know, it's, it doesn't take much faith if you know that the God of the universe who never lies tells you how it's going to end. Because it's like, oh, why would I not jump on board with that? So Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall take hold of them and shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion that these things here, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Words might be changed a little bit, but there's been many, many people throughout history who have said those things about believers, about the things about Christ. And here is God <laughs> up in heaven. He shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. I love reading through Revelation. I'm so glad we're going through it. Because we anticipate that there's this big battle, right? The devil's getting stronger, it feels like. All his, you know, little minions are out there. And then Jesus is going to come, and like Lord of the Rings, there's going to be a big clash, and hopefully good wins. It's not how Revelation really speaks about it. That it's a quick doing away with the devil. It's a quick doing away with his minions. That we don't have this, um, this idea of, man, these bad guys are getting really big. Hopefully we can withstand them. No, it's this idea that, okay, they may break us, they may cast us away, but who in heaven holds us? Christ. Okay, so I can't, I can't do a sermon without speaking about Jesus. Lord, forgive me if I even try. Hebrews 12, verse 2. But Jesus, the God of the universe, came down as a mere man. I say mere you know, came down in the form of man, lived as us, 
gave us a perfect example of how to live life, died for us, all this, just, just stuff that you can't even comprehend. And now here we are looking at why he did it. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, as we always should, the author and finisher of our faith, that he started it, he initiated it, and he's finishing it all the way through, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he has sat down at the right hand of God. So before Jesus was born, there was rejoicing, right? You have John the Baptist leaping in his mother's womb when he sees, when, you know, Mary and um, Martha meet. You have Mary's song rejoicing. And then after he's born, you have the shepherds rejoicing. You don't have many times, um, and I can neither confirm this or whatnot, but there's, you don't have many times in the gospel where it says that Jesus is rejoicing or that Jesus has joy. And a lot of commentators believe it's because he just had this joyous countenance about him that it w- they didn't need to note it because they had to note when he was weeping. They had to note when he was sorrowful because he had this joyous countenance about him that for me, it's hard for me to have a joyous countenance, right? It's easy to get in my own head, my own world. But you have Jesus here, the absolute example of joy. That Jesus is joy, not just a bringer of joy. You have joy in Jesus' ministry. Every single person that he healed, the miracles that he, they ran away rejoicing, right? Jumping up and down. That Jesus brought joy unlike anything else. But why did Jesus go to the cross? We know it's you know, for those of you that, you know, know these basic things, it's, you know, to redeem man back to himself. That that was enough of a, that that mission was enough of a priority in God's eyes that he saw it as a joy, that he will despise the cross. I love what my dad said last week, like the cross back there. It was not a glorious day in terms of weather, events, people. There was people cursing God. There was people, you know, thinking that they finally did it. They got rid of this blasphemous guy, all these things. It was a day that was dark. It was a day that was extremely dreadful. Like Christ w- saw a joy in that. That we have the God of the universe who created everything with just words in his mouth, who came down and let words of mere people curse him, mock him, and then crucify him. And he did that because it was a joy set before him. I love, I can't, I can't remember that song. I have a terrible memory with songs and everything. But there's a song that says, um, when I look to the cross, or when all I see is the cross, you see an empty tomb. That Jesus was able to see the future of what this brought about. That God doesn't see us sin before the cross. That God sees us as sin crucified now forever in Christ because of the resurrection of him. That it was a joy for God to come down, live among man, be cursed by man, to die by man, and then to be raised again to bring man back to himself. It was a joy. C.S. Lewis, joy is the serious business of heaven. Such a, such a simple thing that Christmas is coming before we even know it. You know, joy to the world. Joy is this thing that we've heard our entire lives. But what is joy? Joy is lasting. Joy is permanent. Joy is a thing that only God can give. I don't know what your things in life are that make you happy. Um, some of them are probably really good. <laughs> you know, like example, my son. Like my son's a good thing. It's a huge blessing. But if that joy overweighs this joy that I feel at times of work, at times in just dealing with hard people, then I don't have a true joy that's come from the Lord because God has given me a joy that I can deal in all of those circumstances. I don't know if I could say right now if I was thrown in prison, if I could be praising um, praising the Lord and bringing people to salvation besides throwing a pity party for myself. Joy is something that should mark the Christian. Joy is something that should be abounding in the Christian life. It is something I encourage you to do further studies in. Um, a, the sermon, it's, it's not something that is super complex. It's not something that I'm not really good at doing this. I know that. Um, but it's something that is dear to me because it's something that is so hard for me. To look around this world, just read the news for five minutes and you'll already just be 
shaking your head and probably throwing your phone across the room. It's unbelievable the things that are happening around us. And yet, these Christians lived at times of intense persecution, watched atrocities that are I can't even comprehend, and they're praising the Lord because he knows that the Lord is not done with this earth, not done with man. So I pray that this week you will have joy, a true joy that comes from heaven, that is lived out through the Spirit, that in order to do it, you have to abide with Christ. It is not something that you can go out on your own. We are just branches. Don't forget who we are. We're tools in a master's hands. Nothing good comes from us. Let us pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, oh, perfect, perfect God, I cannot believe that you use imperfect people for your purpose. But God, we are humbled, we are honored, Lord, we come here this morning from so many different places in our lives. Some of us broken, some of us lost. And the idea of joy can be one that that's for other people. It can be this idea that if people experience what I experience, then they'll know that joy is not possible for me. But Lord, that is not what your scriptures say. That is not what your word is saying. That if we are, call ourselves Christians, if we call ourselves the call of the Lord, that we are to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, giving thanks. Lord, those are not things that are recommended. It's not things that you would like us to do, but if we don't, it's okay. No, Lord, they're commands by you. That when we have coworkers treat us badly, when we have family members reject us, when we lose loved ones, help us, Lord, give thanks, to pray, and to rejoice. You're so good, God. You're so good. I can, I just am just dumbfounded that you choose to use people like me. Man, Lord, if you knew exactly what I've done, you would not choose me. And yet, here you are, knowing exactly every little thing that I've done, and still choosing me. I praise you for that, Lord. We love you. In your name.